We are here with our human relations course and we are going into a brand new chapter and this chapter will be on motivation. And the title of the chapter is Understanding Your Motivations. Very big literature. Uh, so our chapter will not focus on every theory and every approach that exists in motivation, but will focus on what we can do in the workplace and managers' choices. So we are starting out with a quote, and the quote that we have on the screen right now is, a champion needs a motivation above and beyond winning. And that goes to illustrate the fact that motivation is very complicated. We have a lot of different things, both internal to ourselves and external to us that sits in the environment around us that motivate us. Uh, so a very um, new, not nuanced, but I want to say interwoven concept in that there are many different things that come together to make us motivated. And so we'll start out this chapter by looking at dissatisfaction, which is sort of the opposite <laughs> Of, of being motivated, when we are unhappy and disengaged in work. And so we are uh, looking at the topic of being able to discuss why you or other people may not be satisfied at work. And that will be the theory of dissatisfaction uh, that we will be looking at. So many, many theories have actually attempted to tell us and describe what makes a satisfied person at work versus a not satisfied person at work. And knowing this, knowing our motivations and knowing what is making us dissatisfied is very helpful because then we can choose the right career path for ourselves. And that is better for us and that is better for the company. And maybe this is a surprise to you. I, I think not. A uh, lot of what we know about motivation is that it's not about the money. If you talk to managers at companies, they always say, if I had more money, if I could give a bonus. However, <laughs> satisfaction at work and motivation, mo money is one small part of it. And there's so much more. Uh, including the job itself, our personality, etc., that actually impacts motivation and satisfaction. So here is the process of job withdrawal. Have you ever felt unhappy at a job? You probably have. Most of us have, right? Think about how did that end up in that space? How did you go through the process of being unhappy? Most of us do not start unhappy. We start happy. We start with good intentions. We start with high motivation levels. And then gradually we become unhappy. And this is given to us by the job withdrawal theory by Dan Farrell and James Peterson. And this theory tells us that people develop a set of behaviors, things that we do, actions, so that we can avoid work when we are unhappy. And so these behaviors include, it should say these, yeah, these behaviors include behavior change, physical withdrawal, and psychological withdrawal. So here is job withdrawal theory. And it has, as you can see, it has four different steps to this. And we start here at the top. And so in this first step, the employee becomes dissatisfied. So we can be dissatisfied for any number of reasons. Right? There's a million different reasons for why something happens, right? So there is dissatisfaction in step one. And when that has happened, we now have behavior changes in step two. And these behavior changes can include things such as whistleblowing, changing conditions such as applying for other jobs, uh, looking for um, ways to not participate on the project, 
not replying to emails, right? So we have behavior changes where we're trying to change the situation. So we're trying to fix what is wrong. And if that doesn't work, right? Or if we are not finding satisfaction still, we're still unsatisfied. In number three, we now have physical withdrawal. Here we are actually leaving the job. We are starting to not come into work. We are looking for a different team to work with inside the organization. That would be an internal transfer. And that leads us to the number four, which is psychological withdrawal. So psychological withdrawal is when we disengage either in the job, with our coworkers, we are now not longer, not any longer committed to the organization. We work less. We essentially just check out, right? And there's probably a fair amount of organization where you have people in some of these stages. They're trying to change the situation. Nothing happens. They're looking for a new job. They leave the team. They go to another branch within the organization or they just essentially just do the bare minimum to stay in the job and check out. So we have a lot of research that tells us when people can be motivated, when people can be happy at work, and the opposite of that. And some of the first studies that came through was the Hawthorne studies. And this was between 1927 and 1932, early 1900s, or no, early, a third into the decade. Um, there was a series of experiments that were conducted by a gentleman named Elton Mayo, 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 Mayo. It was in the Western Electric Hawthorne Works in Illinois, United States. And so we call them the Hawthorne Studies. And Mayo uh, developed these experiments to see how the physical and environmental factors of workplace, such as lightning and break times, would impact people's motivation levels. And so this was some of the first research that really looked at human motivation at work. And what they found was really surprising because it didn't matter what he did or what the experimenters did, right? So brighter lights, dimmer lights, colder, warmer. Still, the worker output kept improving. And that is surprising. If you're in a cold and dark place, you would think you would stop working. But the employees, the workers still kept working. And the conclusion for this was that they were happy that somebody was paying attention to them. They were getting visibility and attention from the researchers. And so we have to value our people. They want to be seen and cared for. So what is in it for us, right? Clearly, having our career be satisfying and making us happy and being motivated to pursue, pursue it and continue on with it is something that is very salient for all of us, right? Because we spend so much time at work and if that piece doesn't work out right, that's going to impact the entirety of our life, right? And so if we look at that entirety of our life, we can talk about our work-life balance. And work-life balance is something that drives happiness. And it refers to the ability for us to spend time in all of the areas of our life that are important to us. And they are typically work, friends or family, hobbies, things that keep us engaged. And having this balance gives us a sense of purpose, belonging, and we grow from that. And so consider whether you feel that you have work-life balance or not. And if you don't, what are the things you can do? What's the plan you can put together? What's the strategy you can uh, deploy to make sure that you have work-life balance so that you have this satisfaction? We all deserve it, right? So if you have ever been unhappy, as an exercise, think about this experience 
think about how you went through each phase of the job withdrawal process and what that looked like. And we can see, right, that this happens for people at work. So reflect on your own. We know journaling, reflecting, thinking helps us grow. So in summary, the theory of job withdrawal explains the process that someone would go through when they're not motivated or happy at work. And we looked at the Hawthorne studies, which were a series of studies beginning in the 1927 with Elton Mayo that looked at physical environments. But the implications of the study was really clear. Employees want to feel cared about and developed in our companies. With that, with that we have a wrap and I'll see you next time.